Now this DVD is taken from an article that I wrote called Testing the Spirits. You know, sometimes I really wonder why someone who claims to be a Bible-believing pastor, for instance, refuses to listen to the truth. You know, it frankly boggles my mind. I don't know if it's as a result of the postmodern paradigm or just that they have no love of the truth left. I don't know how that can happen to a truly regenerate person. You know, you would think that the Holy Spirit would confirm the truth to them, first in their conscience and finally through the written word. But these days, it's a miracle if it gets that far. You know, I don't know if their conscience has been so seared that they don't hear the Spirit or if they just don't want to know the truth because then they would be responsible for it. You know, that I know that I can't uh, know their motives or the reasons why they reject the truth and refuse to talk about false teaching. But I do know one thing. We are called as true believers to test the spirits. We must do this even if the result is not to our liking or befuddles us as to the reasons. 1 John 4.1, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We learn from this passage that there are spirits behind those who falsely prophesy. We also know that true prophecy from God goes forth in forthtelling as well as foretelling. Anyone who correctly uh, exegetes the Word of God based on the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit has taught them, is prophesying, whether in preaching, teaching, witnessing, or foretelling. Therefore, the verse that we just quoted applies to all those who call themselves apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, preachers. We know that 1 John 4, 1 is speaking in this specific case about those who are talking about Jesus and whether or not they are acknowledging that God came in the flesh. But if we think about this concept a bit, we will realize that it also applies to anything that would degrade the character of Jesus Christ such as a denial of any of the core doctrines, especially the Trinity, the dual nature of Christ, salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, His second coming, and even the authority and inerrancy of Scripture. So testing the Spirit is essential in making sure we are in fellowship with those who, are, who truly have the Spirit of truth. John 16, 13 says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his, on his own, but he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Those who have been born again and have received the Spirit at the moment of true belief receive the Spirit who is truth. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the way, truth, and the life. Those who have the Spirit of Christ belong to Christ and have the Spirit of truth, who will guide them into all truth. Romans 8, 9 You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Jesus Christ is the way, truth, and life. That's John 14, 6. Those who claim they are Christians yet continue to live in lies clearly are not walking in the spirit of truth. They've deceived themselves because what they have given themselves over to is a spirit of falsehood, a spirit of error. 1 John 4, 6, we are, we are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. When you find a person who claims to be a Christian, but will not listen to the truth or has no interest in it, you've already tested them, and they've proven themselves to have a spirit of error. We are then called to do something. We're called to first of all admonish them, Titus 3.10, to rebuke them, Titus 1.13 and 2 Timothy 2.25, and pray for them that they will repent. Matthew 5.44 Now it's interesting that Western Christians don't readily think about the spiritual condition of liars and false teachers. 
That's because their Western paradigm of mostly ignoring the ramifications of the spirit world in favor of the temporal. That's what they do. But John reminds us that there are spirits behind false teachers. Demonic spirits are the ones prompting them to uh, espouse the lies that they espouse or to not accept truth when it's revealed to them. They may not even realize who they're working for or against. But Paul tells us that behind those who masquerade as servants of the Lord, but are liars, is their master, Satan. 2 Corinthians eleven twelve through 15 And I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising, then, if his spirits, his servants, also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. You know, I'm sorry to be so blunt about this this issue, but Christians have to get their minds into a biblical paradigm on this. False teachers, false prophets, false apostles, etc. are advancing the cause of the enemy, not the cause of Christ. Therefore, it's imperative that we try to admonish them, and if they refuse to stop what they're doing and repent, we are to reject and avoid them. Titus 3.10 a man that's a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. A heretic is defined by Peter as one who lays error alongside of truth, secretly introducing destructive heresies. Second Peter 2 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even de- denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Christians are to reject those who preach a false gospel because they are condemned by the Lord. Galatians 1, 8 through 9. But even if uh, we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we've already said, and so now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Even Paul, a foundational apostle, encouraged his listeners to test his teaching against the written word of God. And he stated that those who teach must not go beyond what's written. Acts 17.11, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Do not go beyond what's written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. Believers are to be discerning. Philippians 1, 9 through 11. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may may be able to discern uh, what is uh, best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Proverbs talks about being discerning many times. Proverbs 15, 14, The discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of a fool feeds on folly. Proverbs 17, 24, a discerning man keeps wisdom in view, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. Proverbs 18, 15, the heart of the discerning acquires knowledge. The ears of the wise seek it out. Proverbs 28, 7, he who keeps the law is a discerning son, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. Proverbs uh, 3, uh, 21 says, my son... Preserve sound knowledge and discernment, and do not let them out of your sight. Now, though we are no longer bound to keep the Mosaic law, we are under a law, and that's the law of Christ, which is the law of love. 
which the Holy Spirit actually writes on our hearts. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven through 40. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Galatians 5.14, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, Love your neighbor as yourself. Hebrews 10.16 says this, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. So why do we test teaching against the scriptures? Well, because we're commanded to remain in sound doctrine to keep the faith, to uh, uh, you know, follow the teachings of the prophets, apostles, and Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4.3, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. <laughs> That's the time we live in today. Titus 1.9, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. And Titus 2.1 also says, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. But you know, false teachers are liars and they don't remain in sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 1.10, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders, and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. You know, we're warned by the Lord to test every spirit because many false prophets have gone out. But how do we test the spirits? Well, by comparing what they're teaching and prophesying to the scriptures, and if they're living in the fruit of the spirit. So how do we do that? Well, first you have to be a believer in, in Christ, to be born again, to test anything rightly. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we're also to examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Then we move on to testing our own words and actions to be sure we're in the faith and in sound doctrine. Galatians 6, 4 says each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to someone at somebody else. Well, how much are we supposed to test? The Bible says everything. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Test everything. Hold on to the good. You know, if we're to test, uh, then are we to also to judge? Well, certainly. Now, we're not to judge hypocritically as in Matthew 7.1. In other words, we don't judge someone while doing the same thing ourselves. That's... That's hypocritical judgment. That's what God hates. And we're also not to set ourselves up as a final judge of anyone's salvation. That's God's business. But there are ways in which we are to judge. We are to judge what people teach and prophesy. Paul commanded those who listened to him to judge what he was saved, saying even though he was a foundational apostle. 1 Corinthians 10.15, I speak to a sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. We must learn to judge rightly now because you know what? Someday we will judge the earth and the angels with Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 2-3 Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if they're to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? You know, we're told by the Lord to judge those inside the church because God judges those outside. We are to reject heretics and expel wicked men from the assembly of believers because if they are allowed to remain, they will leaven the whole lump. 1 Corinthians 5, 12-13 What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. That's pretty clear. 
We are to test prophesy, uh, prophecy to see if it comes true and is biblical. A true prophet who is foretelling and claiming to be uh, hearing from the Lord will be 100% accurate. Why? Because he's in worship of the Lord in the spirit and in truth and speaks the truth. We must reject false prophets and remove them from the assembly of believers. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5 says, If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, Let us follow other gods, gods that you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and all your uh, soul. It's the Lord your God you must follow and him you must serve. Keep his commands and obey him, serve him and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death because he preached rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. He has tried... Uh, he has tried to turn you from the way of the Lord your God, uh, the way the Lord your God commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. Wow. This admonition to expel wicked men from the assembly of believers in the Old Testament is mirrored by Paul in 1 Corinthians. Now, false prophets may have a good track record, but you know what? They're never 100% accurate. However, they may be able to fool people into thinking they do. That's where the uh, teaching test comes in. You know, some prophets can look really good, but if they're teaching heresy, you can be sure it's a test from God to see if you will really love him with all your heart. John tells us that if we love the Lord, we will obey his commands. That's John 14, 21, uh, 15, 10, 1 John 5, 2 through 3, and 2 John 1, 6. The Bible commands us over and over again to test, discern, and judge teaching, prophecy, and fruit. We must reject heretics who are unrepentant. If they do not obey the Lord in this, we are to, we are proving that, that if we do not obey the Lord in this, we're proving that we do not love him. Deuteronomy 18.20 says, But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything that I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. Now, we don't put false prophets to death today, but we are to remove ourselves from their presence. Deuteronomy 18.22 says, But what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord, if, if a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord, does not take place or come true, that's a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. You know, we're not to be afraid or concerned with what false prophets predict because they have another spirit and they're liars. The Lord is against those who give false prophecies. Jeremiah 23, 32. Indeed, I'm against those who, falsely, who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them, and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 27, 15 says, If you, uh, I, I have not sent them, declares the Lord. They are prophesying lies in my name. Therefore, I will banish you, and you will perish, both you and the prophets who prophesy to you. Yikes! Those who follow false prophets will share in their judgment. Jeremiah 5.31, the prophets prophesy lies, the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love it that way. But what will you do in the end? That's the big question. Jeremiah 23.31, yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their tongues and yet declare the Lord declares. Ezekiel 13.9, my hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. They will not belong to the council of my people or be listed in the records of the house of Israel, nor will they enter the land, the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. You know what? We are not to even listen to false prophecy. 
Jeremiah 39, 16. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are uh, prophesying to you. They will fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. That's what we see today. False prophets are often those who claim they had a dream or a vision of the Lord or from the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 25 says, I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. Jeremiah was told by God about the motivations of, uh, of false prophets. But the end result is that they are not really in communication with God at all nor are they walking in the spirit of truth. Jeremiah 14, 14, Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. That's a very good verse that tells exactly the things that false prophets do. Now three of these motivations are certainly tied to another spirit. False visions are a way for the enemy to delude people who then pass that delusion to others. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Liars tend to leaven others with their lies. Using divination, as many modern false prophets do, who get alleged messages from God through natural means, is another way the spirit of error can deceive people into thinking that they're hearing from God. Ezekiel 22:28, Her prophets whitewash these deeds for them by false visions and lying divinations. They say, this is what the sovereign God says when the Lord has not spoken. Then there are those who have given themselves over to fallen angelic beings, spirit guides, who, and they idolize them. Also those who follow false apparitions like Marian apparitions around the world. But false prophecy can come from people deluding themselves. So we need to try to ascertain if a person is simply self-deluded or deluded by another spirit. We also need to apply the test of fruit to test for the spirit of truth and spirit of error. Matthew 7, 15 through 20 says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. The final test is to compare the words and actions of any teacher or prophet with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 18-25. Notice that the passage I just read comes right after the passage most Christians quote today to try to make a case that they are we are not to judge at all, namely Matthew 7, 1. If you read on, you realize that judge not is not to be applied to every situation. The Bible has specific criteria on how to judge and how not to judge. In judging fruit, it's also helpful to look at the list of things in Galatians 5, 18-25 that are the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. If a person falsely prophesies even once, they're likely using divination and false visions. Are they trying to build a following and promote themselves, gaining fame? Then they likely have selfish ambition. Do they promote drunk in the spirit? That's the sin of drunkenness. If they're stripping the poor of their money with crooked money-raising schemes, that's not the fruit of kindness. If they're Meetings are marked by wild manifestations. They don't have the fruit of peace or self-control. And if they're cocky mockers, they do not have the fruit of gentleness. Galatians 5, 18 through 25 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under law. Under, under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, uh, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, 
uh, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Those who keep in step with the Spirit will evidence that in telling the truth and accepting and fighting for the truth. Those who are out of step with the Spirit may be self-deluded or being influenced by another spirit. Those who do not have the Spirit have no conscience about telling lies and have no love of the truth. Revelation 21.8 But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's the second death. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness uh, deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Those who continue to falsely prophesy, teach false doctrines, make claims to be foundational apostles, make money off false healing claims, etc., will end up having God put them on them of powerful delusion. And with that comes irrevocable judgment. That being said, it is then imperative that we test the spirits, for many liars have gone out and are infiltrating the churches today. Sandy Simpson and my ministry is called Apologetics Coordination Team. Now I wrote a book in order to basically help Christians to be more discerning and the name of that book was called Discernment Toolkit. I basically was asking the question, do you want to be able to see your way through to clear biblical discernment? Do you want a set of tools that will allow you to disciple your loved ones so they will stand firm in the faith? want to sort out many of the false arguments and teachings that have invaded the churches, then Discernment Toolkit is what you need. It contains clear, concise, biblical teaching on how to discern, test, and judge with righteous judgment. Now, chapter by chapter are laid out for basically personal Bible study as well as group study. And the book has been used by a number of groups. Now, in that 400-page book, you get time-tested advice on subjects with chapter titles like Judge Rightly, Demolish Arguments, Know What You Believe, Know What They Believe, Define the Terms, Protect Your Church, Avoid False Unity, Get the Leaven Out, Be a Humble Servant, Worship God as Sovereign, Preach the Real Gospel, Pray in the Spirit, Be Wary of the Doctrines of Men, don't follow their example, test everything, don't shipwreck your faith, look for the fruit, obey the Lord and others. And that limited edition book is available 
now for $18 plus shipping and handling at this URL. Now what the video promo that I'm doing is about is to offer you a special price on the video study series from this book uh, that I developed a, a while ago. And it includes a lot of footage of false teachers and false prophets. And it's going to help you or your group learn how to test, discern, and judge teaching and prophecy that's out there today. Now half of that series is actually set up to play a clip of false teaching, stop the DVD, and discuss what the false teaching is advocating. Then my comments which follow. Now here's an example of that technique which was used a number of times in those sessions. If your group likes to hear me talk about confession, blab it and grab it and all that other junk you've talked ugly about me and said about all us folks who talk about confession, talk on, brother. You can't interfere with the covenant that I have of Jesus as the apostle and high priest of my words. Kenneth Copeland is a word faith heretic of long standing. This clip is one example among many of how Copeland twists the word of God to his own purposes. The KJV says it this way, Hebrews 3.1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Copeland took the translation that best suited the doctrinal position of word of faith teachers where they believe that whatever they confess with their mouth, God is duty bound to give them. They teach that they can literally create reality with their confessions, including health, wealth, and anything else. This is because they actually believe they are little gods. We will cover that issue in the next section. If you read other translations, you'll begin to see what, uh, what this verse is really saying. It's not saying that Jesus Christ is the high priest of what we confess with our mouths, but that the Jesus Christ we follow and confess as the Lord and Savior is our high priest in heaven. Let's look at it again, Hebrews 3.1. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess, NIV. Hebrews 3.1, so then my brothers in holiness who share in a heavenly calling, I want you to think of Christ Jesus, the apostle and high priest of the faith we hold. That's Philip's translation. Hebrews 3.1, therefore, holy brethren, sharers with others in a heavenly invitation, fix your thoughts on Jesus, Christ, on Jesus the apostle and high priest, whose followers we profess to be. To be. That's Weymouth. So, does this constitute heresy or false prophecy in violation of the core doctrines of the faith? Yes. Kenneth Copeland is a heretic because he's making himself equal and even the boss of God. This is in violation of the doctrine of the triune nature of the Godhead, in that there is only one God in three persons who is omnipotent and all-knowing. God is the one who has the power to create reality, not his creation or his creatures. Therefore, we must reject Kenneth Copeland as a heretic because he is in violation of a core doctrine of the faith and has not repented of it. So this is an excellent tool to use in group Berean studies and features a leader's guide as well with suggested um, Bible verse and topics for further discussion. Importantly, it covers the core doctrines how we can use them to test, and examples where the DVD, DVD can be paused and issues discussed. So this DVD series is available now for $25 plus shipping and handling. It's a, it's a three DVD set. And it's available to those who have viewed this uh, YouTube video promo only. You can get this special prize, which is $5 off the original set price by going to this URL on your screen.